Hello and welcome to today's event entitled Fishing and Social Engineering Trends in 2018 is the worst yet to, yet to come. Uh, my name is David Davis from Actual Tech Media. Today's event is brought to you by Know Before and I'm proud to be joined by Mr. Eric Crone. He's a security awareness advocate at Know Before and he'll be talking to us all about fishing and social engineering trends in 2018 today. He's got a ton of really expert experience to share on today's event. Uh, there's a few little housekeeping things I wanna point out before we jump into it. Uh, first off, we wanna make this a very educational event, so I encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like. As I said, uh, Eric has a ton of security experience to share with you today, so uh, blow us away with all your uh, fishing and security uh, and social engineering questions. Um, also, at the end of the event today, we'll be giving out an Amazon $300 gift card to one lucky attendee. So I appreciate you staying with us till the end of the event. And also we have a handout there in your console you can download, uh, which is uh, from Know Before on uh, how to transform uh, your security for, uh, let's see, the exact title is how to transform employee worst practices into enterprise best practices. So if you just click on that PDF handout, you can download that right now and share with your, your friends and family. And um, I believe that's it. Now, today's topics, uh, we'll be talking about the current threat landscape in enterprise security. We know it's, it's really severe. We'll talk about the scary new threats that will be on the rise in 2018. We'll discuss the next innovations of ransomware, phishing, and social engineering. And more, most importantly, you'll learn what you can do to make your organization a harder target for cybercrime and how to create what Eric calls the human firewall. And so you'll learn what that is during Eric's presentation. And with that, I'm excited to introduce Mr. Eric Crone of Know Before. Eric, thanks for joining us. All right, thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here, David. I really appreciate it. Um, tell everyone a little bit about me. Um, I'm a security guy from way back. Uh, started in the IT and security world uh, about the mid 1990s or so. And uh, I've worked in all kinds of different organizations and industries from uh, manufacturing to DOD, um, all sorts of other environments as well. Um, I, most recently though, um, I've been involved, I was the uh, security manager at the Second Regional Cyber Center Western Hemisphere, which is a fantastically long name, uh, but basically it's the US Army's uh, area that handles networks across North America. So I, I've been around this for quite some time. I've seen a number of things and, you know, quite frankly, um, the social engineering and phishing pieces are, are just getting worse year after year. I mean, this is something that's been around for a very long time. Uh, if we remember the I love you viruses and Melissa virus and stuff like that back from the days, um, this is not something that uh, that's brand new on the scene. However, it is something that just keeps happening. And uh, honestly, what's going on out here, what's what's happening as a result of it is getting worse and worse. These data breaches we're seeing, these ransomware attacks, uh, so many of them are caused by social engineering issues. Uh, that's why I think it's so important to talk about this. Now, the organization I'm with, uh, Know Before, uh, we've been around since uh, 2010. Uh, we're out of uh, Clearwater, Florida, which is absolutely fantastic this time of year. So if you're up in the snow, um, uh, you have pity from me. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, what we do is we, we have a simulated uh, phishing platform and a, a social engineering uh, security awareness training uh, platform. So basically what we do is we allow people to train their users how to spot some of the bad things that are in emails and be able to turn that around and report these phishing attacks uh, and then not fall prey to them. I mean, really. So our, our goal is building that human firewall for organizations. Um, what we're going to talk about today, you know, we're going to talk about the uh, the current threat landscape, as you said, new stuff that's going on, and then just a few things uh, as we move along as well. So let's not spend any more time here. Let's move on to this and let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the current threat landscape. And I love this slide. I absolutely love this slide. You know, um, it, it comes down to everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, and, and that's a Mike Tyson quote. You know, we also had uh, some stuff in the, the military that was, uh, you know, no good plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, basically, things fall apart very quickly when it goes wrong. OK, uh, up until that point, you feel all great. And then when when something happens, it's just it's bad. 
So what we want to do is we want to try to work towards improving the reflexive behavior when something this happens like this, like when you get punched in the mouth by ransomware or a breach or something like that, or a phishing attack, you want to have a reflexive behavior. You don't want to have to pause and think about what you're doing each time. Uh, in the military, you know, we had a habit of uh, doing things over and over again, doing drills. And while the first or, or second or even the third time you've done something, you know how to do it. Uh, even though you know how to do it, that doesn't build that muscle memory, if you will. So when it's time to do it quickly, you're not having to think about each step. So that's kind of the idea is building reflexive behaviors like that when it comes down to these sorts of attacks. Uh, and these attacks are just happening more and more often. Uh, you know, 98% of attacks rely on social engineering. We see and hear this all the time in the wild. People talk about it all the time where, you know, even the red teams, when they're doing the uh, the penetration testings and stuff, the ethical hacking, when they can't get through on the technical piece, they turn to the people, and they're incredibly successful getting the people uh, to fall for this. And many times, that's how they end up uh, getting into the systems on these red team attacks. So we know that the attackers go for that low-hanging fruit. And unfortunately, that's humans. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? You have users, they're already in your system. They have permissions, they have rights to all of the things that, quite frankly, you wanna have rights to, or at least rights to things that you can use to get you to other things by pivoting. So it makes sense that you attack the humans. Um, it, it just, this is a much easier way to do it than to try to hit the technology. So what we found is in the current threat landscape, um, this is a study by Osterman here. They did a pretty good study here over the years of what's going on. And, and the two top things are definitely web or email. And if you think about it, both of those are definitely two people, right? They're, that's a people focused sort of thing. Um, email has taken the lead over web in the last couple of years. Uh, I don't think that's a huge surprise to anyone, but both of those things deal with user behavior and, and how they're doing this sort of thing, right? So if you can spot a phishing attack, it makes it a lot easier to spot, say, a malicious um, advertisement that's asking you to do something. The principles are the same. They're trying to social engineer your people into doing the wrong thing. And that wrong thing can lead to uh, them getting into your system, uh, giving up credentials. You know, credential phishing is huge. And if you think about it this way, when the bad guys are able to get uh, the email credentials for an individual, uh, the things they can do with that are, uh, are staggering, right? You can use that email account now to attack people from an actual legitimate trusted account. Uh, you can gain a lot of information from people uh, for, from the targets based on current or, or uh, past uh, conversations you've had with these people. So all of these things that they're doing towards the people are, uh, are amazingly effective, unfortunately. So this is kind of where we're at right now. The bad guys are hitting uh, through the, the social engineering and through the human element over and over again. And again, this is true for ransomware. This is true for um, breaches, you know, uh, exfiltration of data where somebody's gonna get in and they end up getting uh, access to your network. So much of this stuff is happening through the users. Uh, it, it's a bit scary, quite frankly. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about this. You know, what scary new threats and innovations in ransomware, phishing, and social engineering do we see for next year? Um, Got to be honest with you, first off, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move into this. But, you know, the fact is it's not going to go away in 2018. So don't plan those vacations around you being able to have a lot of time uh, that you would normally be spending dealing with these attacks because, uh, yeah, it's, it's really going nowhere, unfortunately. So speaking about that, our number one scary new threat for next year, exponential growth of the ransomware play, especially as a service strains. Uh, I've been talking about as a service strains for a while now, and it's, it's fascinating how this works. And really what that means is the bad guys have now decided that rather than just selling the, uh, the ransomware itself, as a product, uh, they're actually 
dealing with bringing up the back end, the infrastructure for command and control, um, for dealing with the Bitcoin payments, for dealing with all of that stuff. And why this is really scary, at least to me, is this opens the door for a lot of people who are not technical to start playing in the ransomware game. Uh, let's face it, there are a lot of people out there that are very skilled in social engineering, but not horribly technical. Well, now these people don't have to be technical to build up that back end. Uh, when you start looking at things like um, Philadelphia, for example, a ransomware strain I talk about a lot, it's, it's fantastic. It's got a, a wonderful marketing video on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, completely customizable, top to bottom. You can change just about anything within um, the software itself. You generate this yourself through a wizard. Um, you can set up Russian roulette where it automatically deletes files every so often because that's scary to people when they start seeing files disappear. Um, you can set the Bitcoin amount, all of that kind of good stuff. All of the backend infrastructure is taken care of by the bad guys. To get into Philadelphia, it's right around the $400 mark. That's it. That's all it costs to purchase that. Um, there's another one called DOT that I like to talk about because it's such a different way to try to do this. DOT is a ransomware as a service uh, deal where, again, you go through a wizard and you build out the software. Um, you build out the, uh, the malware there. And in the end, what happens is these, these folks, they coach you on the proper things to try to do, um, the types of emails that work in different regions, uh, a lot of that information, because DOT is a, uh, it's a zero dollar, doesn't cost you a thing, it's a 50-50 profit sharing model. So the idea is they want you to be successful, so they're successful, and they handle, again, all of the technical stuff, including the Bitcoin, Bitcoin payments and, and distribution and all that. So this is why this sort of stuff, to me is very, very scary. There's a lot of social engineers out there that are very skilled, but didn't have the, uh, didn't have the, uh, the technical ability to get into the game until now. Now, here they are. Number two, um, this one's a little bit interesting here. The, the pseudo ransomware attacks used to distract organizations, right? Um, this is kind of the, the trash can fire, if you will. So somebody sets a trash can fire and the people respond to that, the security people respond to that. And while they're dealing with this very large in your face sort of attack, very much like ransomware, which is popping up on screens and all that, um, they can be sending other attacks off to the side there where people aren't necessarily looking as well. So we expect to see a lot more of these distraction attacks, if you will. Um, it's good for them because, well, they, they can make money off of it if they end up paying the ransom. That's awesome. But um, there's other things going on at the same time. Like we saw this happen with a, a ransomware attack. And then while that was going on, there was some very, very targeted attacks on the upper leadership in an organization while the ransomware attack was going on. So we expect to see a lot more like this. I also expect to see in the same sort of breath uh, ransomware attacks where it's not just the uh, the ransomware, the crypto ransomware holding your data hostage to get it decrypted, but they're also going to exfiltrate things and they're going to be demanding ransoms not to release it um, and, uh, you know, things like that. We saw some of that sort of thing go on with Uber, right? Um, pretty ugly stuff, but, uh, you know, I, I expect to see these one-two punches happening a little bit more often moving forward. So number three, number three is an interesting, <laughs> automation. We think automation is so good for us, right? And it is, it's, it's a time saver, it's fantastic. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all this kind of good stuff, um, fantastic. The problem is the bad guys have a lot of the same technology. Uh, last year was over a billion dollar industry for ransomware. That's a significant amount of money, right? So these are organized operations doing this, not just like the kid in the basement. Um, this isn't that sort of attack. This is a uh, very organized. So automation is going to be leveraged against individuals more and more often. Not only that, if you think about the amount of data that's recently been leaked, let's say through the Equifax um, breach there, uh, the bad guys are going to be able to take a lot of this kind of information that's been leaked from that, and they're going to be able to craft very, very targeted 
spear phishing emails automatically without a lot of human intervention, right? So they can take some of these dumps and know that you have a city uh, credit card, let's say. And so what they're going to send you is going to come from Citibank. And if they know that your account number is there due to what they were able to find through Equifax, putting that number up in the top corner as the you know security spot there uh, where it shows the last four or something, they're going to be able to replicate that sort of stuff. And it's going to be able to be done automatically through a lot of these dumps. So we're going to see where automation is making our lives easier and tougher at the same time. Um, detecting these really, really significant uh, spear phishing targeted attacks is going to be that much harder moving forward. And unfortunately, even right now, um, our technical solutions up in the uh, you know, the forefront there and the, the spam filters and that sort of stuff. Um, there's a considerable amount of stuff that already makes it through there. We just saw a study where 10% of the, the stuff still makes it through, which you think 10%, um, that's not that big a, a deal. But the sheer volume of emails that goes out every single day in these phishing emails, 10% is still a huge, huge number. Um, so we're going to see that probably getting even worse moving forward next year. Uh, the next one, extortion scams with a long tail, right? Sort of, again, like what we saw there with, uh, with our good friends at, uh, at Uber. Um, you know, we have your data, we'll release it, or you're going to be paying us, right? And then they'll be able to come back to the well on those things quite a bit. Traditionally, a ransomware attack, you're going to be done, whatever's going to happen is going to happen in the first 72 hours or so. After that, um, it's a matter of cleaning up the pieces, right? The problem with some of these things that they're doing now is these are designed to last a long time. For example, we've actually seen where the bad guys have, uh, um, have demanded nude photos of somebody in order to uh, to release the data or decrypt the data. Well, now those photos can be used against the people as an extortion technique, right? Um, now you're going to pay us for this or we're going to release it. And that's something they can keep coming back to the well for, for a long, long time. So where it used to be that things were done very quickly, um, I expect to see more and more attacks that are really driving towards these extortion scams like this and, and holding that for, uh, for ransom. If you look at what happened to the leadership in Uber and all of those things, when it was discovered that they had paid these guys not to release the information or to talk about it, um, that's going to make other people, when confronted with the same thing, really have to consider what's going on. Um, in one one step, you know, the bad guys they they kind of held to their word essentially um, and didn't dump all of that stuff. It, it came up different ways, but. Um, you know, people are going to consider, well, maybe that is the right thing to do. So, but again, that's something they can come back to over and over again. Well, you saw that this happened. Now we're going to charge you an extra, you know, 20 grand or we're going to let it go. It's just going to keep going on. So number five, increased search result tampering, drive users to compromised websites. We already see a bit of this uh, going on through Kind of ads that are posted on on different places whether it be uh you know google ads sponsored stuff or uh, social media sites things like that um, but the bad guys have gotten pretty clever about purchasing search results that uh, are going to send somebody to something that looks like the legitimate website but it really isn't um, I, I've heard stories about this sort of thing going on, especially now around the holidays where everyone and their brothers kind of buying things. Um, and, you know, it's really tempting around the holidays when you see these uh, these toys that every kid wants but nobody can get, right? Um, and, and then you see an ad pop up that says they have them for a, a reasonable price, right? This is a vendor you've never heard of, you've never dealt with before, but you know we got to have the uh, the toy of the week, and so people click on that. They go to these sites that are compromised, that either drive down some uh, some malware, or you know just scam you out of money, get you to uh, put your credentials in for certain things. There's there's lots of ways to to leverage this, but we expect to see more of this sort of search result tampering going on throughout next year. So we got to be careful about that and understand the threats that are behind 
um, these sorts of attacks and, and what it is you click on and just how badly that can go for you. So number six, this is one I'm definitely uh, uh, on board with. New families of mobile malware surfacing with powerful new features to steal creds, et cetera, right? Again, email credentials, incredibly valuable. A lot of um, people use their mobile devices now to connect back into their organization's email or other assets there, right? And I know, you know, when, when bring your own device first kind of came on the scene, that pretty much always meant a cell phone. Uh, but what we're seeing now is there are so many tablets and personally owned devices and things like that that people are doing work on. Um, targeting these mobile devices only makes sense, right? Um, I, I've seen like a leaker locker was not too long ago. Actually, it was downloaded from the Google Play Store. Uh, when you installed it, it went through and it, it asked the users to provide some permissions to this uh, to this software. and. The software, I mean, the permissions was like, you know, scrolling through pages of, of permissions, but people are still willing to do that. They don't know or they don't think about how that could be an issue, and so they grant the permissions. And what this did is it gathered up all the photos and, and all that stuff on your phone, and then um, it turned around, popped up a lock screen, and said, we're going to send all of this data, the photos, your emails, um, all of this stuff to everybody in your email and phone contacts list in 72 hours if you don't pay us 50 bucks, right? What's important about this is it was downloaded from a legitimate app store. It didn't require root permissions. This could be anybody. They gave it the permissions to do this. Uh, there's no reason this can't be leveraged in the future for crypto ransomware attacks. Uh, same sort of thing. You give it the permissions to do that because people don't know better or don't think about it. And next thing you know, um, all of these mobile devices are being attacked. So I, I fully expect to see this sort of thing happening more and more this next year, whether it's ransomware, whether it's doxing, whether it's, you know, loading things on your phone that will uh, that'll capture your credentials when you're logging into bank accounts or, you know, heaven forbid, Bitcoin wallets. Um, <laughs> these sort of things are going to be much, much more um uh, prolific, I think, next year. And then number seven, this is an interesting one because the repercussions can, uh, this could be huge, right? And that is blameware and false flag operations. Now, we know that uh, the EU has basically come out and said, you know, it, it can be an act of war for a cyber attack. Uh, and that's a pretty strong declaration. Um, so, why not, if you're, uh, say, an organization that wants to uh, spread discourse, why not attack things and leave behind evidence that point at someone else, right? Because now we're, we're classifying this as an act of war. That's a pretty serious thing. Um, in addition, from a, uh, a corporate espionage sort of uh, way of doing things, if you're a government contractor, and let's say you're bidding on a very, very large contractor, and let's say an unscrupulous um, other individual or other organization uh, has an attack on that makes it look like you were involved, even if it's proven later that that wasn't true, that could absolutely ruin your chances for some of these government contracts while you're under investigation. Uh, there's a lot of ways you could leverage this in some pretty, pretty ugly ways, given that this declaration um, has been made uh, by the EU there. So I expect to see hopefully not bad, terrible things, but I expect to see more of this sort of thing and probably some interesting ways that the bad guys are going to be leveraging these sorts of attacks um, because quite frankly, they can do a lot of damage just by making it look like somebody else did something wrong. So uh, let's move in here. Let's uh, Let's look at some bonus stuff here, right? Bitcoin wallet attacks, man, we're seeing that already. Um, this is just, it's crazy. You know, the, the price of Bitcoin, the, uh, the, the vaporware cyber money, that's really nothing. <laughs> it, it just kills me, blows my mind. Um, but man, these wallet attacks are happening. We're seeing all of this, um, uh, Bitcoin mining stuff happening through advertisements and through things like that. Um, bleeping computer just had a deal where they were showing how this, some of this mining software can actually overheat the phone so much it's like splitting it causing batteries to swell i mean we're turning that into a kinetic attack 
just going after uh, <laughs> cryptocurrency. So expect to see a lot more of that kind of stuff going on just in the background, just through delivered advertisements, all that kind of good stuff, but specifically on Bitcoin wallets. Um, backdooring devices via flashing firmware, yeah, we, we, we've seen that. Um, you get someone uh, compromise a website, put in some, uh, some bad firmware, bam, you have backdoors on 90% of what's going on there. Um, SIM swap attacks, that's basically for cell phones to do two-factor authentication. Um, while you know, that's always a, a concern, it's still safer to have two-factor authentication than no second factor, but expect to see more of these sorts of attacks that are going after the second factor, especially mobile devices. Remember earlier we talked about mobile devices. Um, IOT botnets, uh, instead of creating havoc out for financial gain, right? How about mining? How would you like your all of your uh, your cameras in your in your organization to be mining bitcoins or doing some other stuff like that, right? Criminal uh, first criminal use of blockchain other than Bitcoin. Um, a third of the attacks over the next uh, two years target shadow IT resources BYOD. Like I said, it used to just be that um, people had their cell phones, and and quite frankly, a lot of people were reliant on the IT departments to set up their tel their cell phones to gain access. Um, Any more people are pretty tech savvy and they're able to get their own phones connected to some of the corporate uh, emails and things like that. That That's going to be ugly as we have more and more of these uh, shadow IT type resources connecting to our networks. Um, and then cyber insurance companies still not covering human error unless you specifically ask for it. Um, I've done a couple of talks now at uh, cyber insurance uh, seminars and and, uh, and conferences, and, and quite frankly, these poor folks are trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, it's a very tough time for them, and what's happened is there is no standard out there for cybersecurity insurance. So when you say, yeah, I, I have cyber insurance, um, that doesn't mean the same thing from organization to organization. What it may mean is, um, you know, they'll cover uh, certain parts of the attack as long as it's a crime, but if somebody's tricked into sending money or sensitive information, that's not covered uh, because that wasn't, uh, you know, covered in the attack, the way that the attack works. And sometimes there's uh, crossovers between the crime part of your insurance, again, and the cyber part of it. Um, it's it's quite confusing out there. And these, these folks are trying to get their arms around this, uh, but it's moving pretty fast and people are demanding things. So make sure if you have cyber insurance, you know exactly what, what it'll cover. If somebody gets somebody in your organization to wire out um, you know, a good chunk of money, is that covered? Uh, you might be surprised and find out that it isn't because it's a human error thing. And then uh, you know the, the Wi-Fi spoofing moving into cell towers, you know, stingray thing. And we see some of that, but I think the price is going to come down a little bit and make it more affordable. You know, nowadays for Wi-Fi spoofing, you have a $100 pineapple in your pocket and the world's a happy place. Um, cellular spoofing's still been more expensive, but expect to see more and more of those kind of attacks going on. And that can, you know, go right back to those uh, two-factor attacks um, up there trying to gather that information or, or get in the middle there for that, uh, for that information. So then finally, we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about our wild ass guesses, right? <laughs> so this is like kind of out there stuff, but uh, kind of fun, you know, crypto mining worm using NSA code will spread and steal GPU cycle or CPU cycles. Hmm. Well, we're, we're definitely seeing people trying to do that crypto mining. Um, fraud as a service. Um, forces uh, to, to get omni uh, channel fraud prevention. I mean, this is this is kind of interesting um, uh, to to think about the fact that fraud as a service could go the way that the ransomware as a service goes. Basically, you hire out people to do the social engineering piece, um, or you know, doing those uh, the W two attacks and all that, um, and having to think about the different channels that fraud can come in at. Um, not just via email, but actually phone calls and things like that. So this could get pretty interesting on that. Um, super, super popular uh, sysadmin tool gets compromised with the back door, right? That's not too far fetched. Um, this could this could happen. And again, um, you know, kind of along the lines of that firmware stuff. If somebody's able to get in there and, and compromise a website for somebody and say push an update to something that's backdoored, 
that could get pretty ugly. Um, brand of smart glasses uh, getting pwned, broadcasting everything. Um, you know, we're all worried about our uh, our laptop webcams and we're putting stickers and stuff over that. But what about your smart glasses that are sitting there charging on the countertop, right? Um, somebody takes over that and starts broadcasting or pulling data from that, that could get pretty ugly. Um, home automation service getting hacked and, and millions of unwanted products are ordered, you know. Um, this would be bigger than just the Alexa um, order the whatever thing that went on in the news. Uh, I think it was in LA that that happened. And a bunch of, uh, I think it was like um, castles or play toys or something were ordered by the uh, the person who was saying that uh, on the news broadcast. Pretty ugly stuff, um, but you know, this could happen here. And then all of a sudden all these uh, products are ordered. Um, skimmers on uh, gas pumps, man, we've seen that. Uh, we see that all the time. Uh, I watch that quite a bit and uh, and it's just getting worse and worse. So maybe, you know, we're going to have to go away from uh, doing the actual card swipes on the pumps and force it through smartphones. But then what happens if your smartphone's owned, you know? So um, brand new exploit kit, dozens of zero days from the NSA. Wow, that'd be shocking, right? Uh, we haven't seen anything like that before. Uh, but hey, you know, it could happen again, definitely. And then a massive movement away from traditional antivirus being the signature based stuff towards AI or none at all and rely on Wind Defender. Now, I, I'm not a big fan of the none at all thing yet. Um, I, I really think that uh, signature based antivirus is pretty much dead. It doesn't mean you want to rush out and remove it from everything. But quite frankly, as fast as these things are being created, there's no way to stay on top of that. Um, and so those are pretty much dead already. However, um, as we move into this AI or machine learning sort of stuff and uh, and do more heuristic sort of stuff, I, I think that'll be uh, that'll be a good thing. Well, whether or not it'll be a massive movement, I don't know. Um, I think if uh, if signature based antivirus just falls on its face, which it may, then we could see something like that. So the next thing, what can you do to make your organization a harder target, right? That's kind of what we want to do. Now that I've told you all of the scary things we see uh, or consider are going to start happening, um, what are we going to do about it? Well, let's talk about these eight points to be a hard target. Uh, with any ransomware infection, nuke the machine from orbit and re-image to bare metal, okay? A lot of businesses, um, they'll end up basically think they cleaned up the infection and then they'll restore files from a backup and move on. The problem is we're seeing additional pieces of software being downloaded by the, the initial dropper that gets the ransomware. Uh, you don't know what's still living on that machine and maybe laying low. So nuke it from orbit, it's the only way to be sure. And then restore it from bare metal and be very careful about the files that you're actually restoring. Um, Get secure email and, and web gateways that cover URL filtering. Make sure they're tuned correctly. That's a big one, right? Um, if you have email and web gateways, which hopefully most of us do these days, it's not enough just to turn on these features and let it go, right? Put a little bit of effort into these things. Um, in other words, think about the fact if you're an organization and you only work in the continental US or North America, um, the odds of you actually needing traffic to be coming from an RU domain or somewhere in Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera, are probably pretty low. So lock that down. Don't allow that sort of stuff to come in in the first place, right? Just block it wholesale. These sorts of things are part of the tuning piece of this, uh, knowing where your traffic goes, but don't just throw up a, a, an email or a web gateway and call it good. Think that it's all, you know, that it's just gonna run out of the box, because it's not. Um, but unfortunately, too many people, they, they read the marketing hype, they go, oh, I've got this thing, I put it in, now we're secure. Uh, that's not how these things work, folks. Uh, make sure your endpoint protection or your endpoints are patched regularly. Yes, OS and third-party apps. I get this. You're tired of hearing patch, 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 and I totally get that, especially when you have endpoints or you have places that can't be patched. Um, <clears throat> familiar with this from the medical industry, you may have an MRI machine that does fantastic imaging, but the company that created it was bought out and you know this that and the other thing now the software isn't available for updates uh, you can't get patches for that you can't do any of that sort of stuff um, that's not unheard of okay and I, I totally get that I understand that however that doesn't mean that you just go okay and 
constantly exclude that machine from any of the vulnerability or, or risk assessments, right? Every time there's something that comes out that you should be patching that machine, look at additional ways you might be able to mitigate that threat, uh, whether it be locking it down, making it its own entity, putting something in between it uh, that is more secure and, and basically segmenting it to its own spot on the network. There's lots of things you can do, but you need to think about that. Don't just say, oh, can't patch it and forget about it again. Unfortunately, that happens way, way, way too often. Uh, make sure endpoints are uh, next gen, frequently updated security layers. Okay, absolutely. Again, I'm, I'm kind of dead on the whole signature-based antivirus stuff. Uh, it's just too much stuff going on at the same time, right? So you need some of that next-gen stuff. You need stuff that's going to look at that, the heuristics. But the fact is you can't just rely on one thing, no matter what. It has to be layers. and has to be layers of risk reduction. Um, just having endpoint protection, I don't care what it is, it's not enough. Um, so work on those layers. Make sure that you have that going on. Don't just rely on antivirus uh, to save your skin because you'll be sadly disappointed and, and so may a lot of your customers. Identify users that handle sensitive information and enforce two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. I can't talk enough about this. Um, I am a huge proponent of multi-factor authentication, especially with folks that handle sensitive information or even um, accounts uh, that have very uh, significant privileges on the network and things like that. Multi-factor is something you should definitely be doing. If you're not doing it now, start looking around. It's not all that complicated uh, and it can be very, very powerful uh, when it's deployed correctly. Um, this will protect you from those credential fishes where somebody gets your username and password. They need that additional um, authentication factor. And generally speaking, it will alert you if somebody is not able to do that. Great thing to have, something you definitely want on there. Um, don't forget your policies and procedures, especially dealing with financial transactions, or I'll even add to that, um, transactions related to sensitive information. So we expect to see, you know, CEO fraud's a big deal. We expect to see W-2 fraud starting like right now as we hit the new year. Um, anytime somebody is going to transfer a large amount of sensitive information or a reasonable amount of money, the best policy is to have them be able to pick up the phone, call the CEO or call whoever it is that's requesting it and get a verbal from that individual before they send it. And the organization has to be okay with that. That right there, that step can just drastically reduce your issues with CEO fraud um, just by having that policy in place. Uh, check your firewall configuration, make sure no criminal network traffic. Again, command and control servers, this is where everything goes out to uh, essentially get its information, to get encryption keys, to do all that kind of stuff for ransomware. Um, make sure that your firewall is decent and you're blocking as much of that traffic as you possibly can. Again, it takes some tuning, but these things just popping up in a firewall doesn't fix everything. And then leverage that new school security awareness training. Um, include, yeah, the, the frequent social engineering test uh, using multiple channels. Okay, this goes back to some of the phone calls. What about USB drives and dropping things like that, right? We've shown that time and time again, people will pick up USB drives and want to see what's on it, especially if the bad guys make it enticing at all, you know, something like uh, Q1 layoffs or something along those lines in there, and people can't wait to click. So you've got to teach people that this is an attack and what to look for and how to report it when that happens. So that's our eight points for being a hard target. Uh, moving on. Let's talk about creating that human firewall. This is so important, folks. 91% um, of successful data breaches start with a spear phishing attack. CEO fraud, $5.3 billion gone. Um, W-2 scams. Again, this is going to start happening now where somebody pretends to be someone in leadership and gets your HR department to send out all the W-2s or, or the tax forms on the individuals. And then they turn around and they file those taxes, uh, claim the refunds, and uh, move on out. Then when the people actually go to legitimately file, they find out it's already been done. And a whole world of nightmare kind of opens up for them. And then, of course, yeah, ransomware. 
I mean, we're talking about a lot of money happening in the ransomware world these days. So we know that these are all things that are driven by the human attacks. Now, when you're trying to change these behaviors, when you're trying to make that reflexive behavior, there's some things you have to consider. You have to consider that, you know, individuals, lazy social creatures of habit. This is a fact. This is not something you're going to get around. Um, it's just how that kind of happens. And so when you're doing these programs, consider that. People like to uh, like to do the same thing over and over again. They don't want to change what they're doing. So you have to kind of think about what you're doing when you move uh, people into the right direction and don't try to change everything at once, uh, making a sharp left-hand turn. That just honestly doesn't work and it just frustrates the users. So with that in mind, you know, you can't effectively train on everything. Uh, your goal is really to hit a couple of behaviors at a time. This comes back to the whole like, you know, eating an elephant a bite at a time instead of all at once. Absolutely. Um, so that's your goal. Focus on a couple of things at once, not everything. But, you know, we, we like to talk about the uh, the magic wand sort of uh, uh, thing here where if you could wave a magic wand in your organization and change two to three behaviors, imagine that. What, what would you want to change immediately. Uh, those are the ones that you want to focus on. Just know it's not going to happen immediately. A lot of times that's going to be quick clicking on things that cause me nightmares. Uh, that's that's a no-brainer. The second one very often is password hygiene and how people deal with their credentials and uh, locking their computer and all that kind of good stuff. And then the third may be something a little bit more specific to your organization. But one and two very often have to do with getting people not to click on things and how to handle their passwords and their, their credentials better. So keep that in mind when it comes to that. Now, a sobering truth, something you need to think about. Your awareness program and the content are the visible face of your department to the rest of the company. So there's a lot of users, especially in larger com companies, that you may never talk to in person throughout the year. Um, what they know about you is what comes through the content and your security awareness program, right? Um, if it doesn't look like you're taking it very seriously, they're not going to take the program very seriously either. If it looks like you really don't care, they're not going to care to report things when they do happen because you're setting that precedent. This is what you put in front of users that you may never see again that year until something goes wrong. So you want to make sure that messaging is correct. Uh, a lot of folks, they get thrown by this. How do I even start this? We're technical people. I get it. Totally get it, right? So you're a practitioner. You're a technical guy. You're wearing a lot of different hats. How do I make a program that works? Um, I want to tell you about this because I love this tool. These are automated security awareness program tool. It's called ASAP. It's free. Uh, it's on our website. You can do it. And basically what this does is you answer some questions and it lays out how to do your awareness program. It's fantastic to get you started on this. So it's going to talk about things you may not consider, engaging your stakeholders and then, you know, um, moving down to uh, the different kinds of quarterly training modules you may want to do, knowing it'll build out what training modules you need to be compliant with like HIPAA or PCI or so you know that you've covered all that good stuff. Highly recommend you check out this tool. It's available at uh, knowbefore.com slash resources. It's fantastic for helping getting you started because I know I'm throwing out a lot of stuff here about you know training the people but knowing where to start can sometimes be daunting. This is a great tool for it. I highly recommend you check it out. So five points to consider when you're training your folks, when you're building out this uh, and trying to make the human firewall. Um, awareness in and of itself is only one piece of that defense in depth, all of those layers, but it's a crucial one. You can't and shouldn't do this alone. You need to have other places, other departments within your organization involved in this as well. This is not just something that you're gonna put out there uh, by yourself without co coordinating with others. Um, don't train on everything. Again, pick a couple of things, focus on those. Know that people care about things that are relevant to them. Think about that in your messaging, right? Not only is it important that you don't have ransomware kick off in your, in your organization, but the skills you're teaching these people also keep it from attacking them at home. Think about that. Um, when you message that to people, they're going to pay a little bit more attention. And then the ongoing process really designed to help people make smarter security decisions. So those are five key points to consider right there. Best practices to embrace, have explicit goals. 
get the executives involved. You got to have that leadership involved. Again, two or three things. Focus on them for a while. Uh, if you have met one of them or fixed one of them down to a point where you want to be, um, then move another one in, move that one out. Continue to just working on just two or three things at a time, right? Treat your program like a marketing effort. Do the posters, do the banners, nudge them in the right direction when they're seeing things and make them think about it all the time. And then you fish them frequently to help them. What you're doing is you're helping them work that training that you gave them uh, in a hands-on sort of way, right? So we all sit down and we watch something go across the screen and, and we learn about it. But if we haven't done it hands-on, uh, we're probably not all that comfortable with it, right? It's like going back to the military way. They could show me how to break down a rifle all day long until I go through and I actually do the hands-on and do the cleaning and all that and put it back together. Um, I'm not going to be very effective at it when it comes time to actually have to do it, right? So that's where the fishing is really designed to reinforce that training that you've given to people. The five key takeaways here, prioritize and make your messages and training relevant. Test them frequently to build those reflexes, make that reflexive behavior. Use metrics to tell your story. Look for goals that are like 10% less tickets on malware, 25% or something like that. Use metrics and quantitative numbers to tell your story. Understand that your awareness program fits in the larger context of the organization's culture. You want it to be a good piece of that, uh, but it can't stand alone. It's got to kind of blend into the whole organizational culture. You want to think like a marketer and act like an attacker, um, and that is understand what it is that people are falling for. And, uh, you know, when you get to the point, uh, you should be pretty devious in the things that you're sending your users. Maybe not right in the beginning, but in the, in the end, you're going to be pretty devious about these things because that's what the bad guys are doing, right? And you don't want to train them on things uh, that are so simple, that's not what they're seeing in the real attacks. It takes time to get to that point. But uh, when you do, I'm telling you, man, Fishing your users can be a lot of fun. Coming up with ways to do that, but having that uh, that uh, messaging to them, like, all right, you guys are really kicking butt on this thing. You were spotting these things, so I'm going to have to get a little devious on this. I'm going to have to have a little fun with this, and let's see how you guys spot it this next quarter. That's a very friendly message about what's going on. It's not, um, we're trying to get you, and you're going to lose your job. It's, man, you guys are doing awesome. You're making me step up my game a little bit. Um, but at that point, man, you can start adding all kinds of fun things to the emails uh, that can actually be quite a bit of fun. And then our four steps, really, uh, it's, it's only four steps that make this really work. Baseline testing, know where you're at. If you don't already, we can do this for you free, right? It's called a, a, fish alert, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> a fishing security test. I'll give you a fish prone percentage. So you know where you're at. Maybe you're starting at 20, 30%. Maybe it's a little bit lower. Either way, at least you have a starting point. You want to know where your baseline is. Then you want to train the users, teach them what to look for. Uh, and then you're going to fish them. Again, to reinforce what you trained them on, give them that hands-on, give them the putting it all together and, and seeing it happen. Watch the results, and then as the numbers go down on your phishing test, make them tougher. Uh, and then occasionally you're going to train your users maybe quarterly on certain things that may be happening right at the time. Um, nothing long, just kind of some short things. But you keep repeating this cycle, and it's fantastic what a difference this makes. Um, we've actually seen across 300,000 users uh, a year later using this four-step system here. It's dropped the... Uh, the click rate from almost 16% to 1.2%. That's 93% less clicks on the thing that causes you, you know, that 91% of uh, the successful data breaches are started with. So that's pretty significant. Um, and again, that's 300,000 users from a bunch of different organizations. It really does work that well. Um, and it's really not that difficult to implement. So that's really how you go about making your users uh, a, a human firewall. So then resources, I've already talked about some of these, man, there's some fantastic stuff here. Uh, the Fish Alert button, free tool, highly recommend looking at that. Works with Outlook, Office 365, and Gmail. Uh, the idea is a user sees a an email that they kind of question what's going on, um, and when they get it, all they have to do is click this little button, it wraps it up headers and all, and sends it to somebody in your organization to review. Gets it out of their inbox so they're not tempted to click on it later. 
So um, that's kind of a big deal. It's very, very useful uh, when it comes to having your employees uh, kind of be safe from those attacks. So definitely check these out. Again, all free tools. Uh, these are great resources for folks. Um, so that being said, you know, David, I, I think uh, we're still doing okay on time. I'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. Sounds good. So um, let's see, first question that came in here is, you know, with all these different threats that we're talking about in 2018, is that going to require a lot of user education and training? What, what's your take? Um, I, I think it's, I think what happens here is it's not going to require a whole lot of additional training, but the training has to stay relevant. And you are going to need to kind of up the game a little bit and make sure that you're training people on things that are happening. Again, maybe quarterly is a good way to do some of that. So in other words, you do maybe a, a one hour training or 45 minute training um, in the beginning of the year, or once a year, and then you augment that through some of the like latest greatest that's going on. For example, first quarter is always a big deal with W2 fraud. So you want to make sure that people have a little bit of additional stuff as uh, as attacks and as as trends are happening, so that they're clear on that. Um, I think that. Overall, though, the training itself is is not that much different than we've already been seeing. You teach them to identify phishing emails. You teach them to identify social engineering scams. You teach them how to report it. And quite frankly, th those are very, very uh, effective ways to do this. Yeah, you make a great point. It can't just be the same old training like change your password every quarter and make it complex. The, the attackers are getting more and more complex. They're getting more sophisticated, and the training has to keep up with that. Um, Absolutely. You mentioned um, W-2 fraud. I know we've done a whole webinar on CEO fraud. For those out there in the audience who don't know what W-2 fraud is, do you want to just kind of quickly educate them on that? Ab absolutely. You know, it's very close. It's a close cousin to CEO fraud. And, and again, I did kind of mention this a little bit earlier, um, but it's where somebody who pretends to be, uh, say, someone high level in your organization, say the president of the company, the CEO, they send an email to someone in your HR department and say something along the lines of, um, you know, I need these W-2s. I got to send them to the tax guy. Uh, send them to me in a PDF right away. I need to take care of this. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, it happens that uh, a lot of these HR folks or, or payroll folks, they'll do that because it's the boss asking for it, right? It's his company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, what happens, the bad guys get a hold of this. They turn around, they file all of those uh, those taxes on those people. And uh, they, unfortunately, everybody gets a refund, right? Uh, I guess it's fortunate for the bad guys, but uh, you know they walk away and when they go to file, it's now a giant mess to try to clean up from the individuals. On top of that, once they have your W-2 information, that's some valuable information on the dark web where credit cards, you know, those numbers come and go very, very quickly. Um, however, when you're talking about, um, things that like your social security number and that sort of stuff. When, when people have your W-2 information, that's some pretty significant stuff. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's very valuable from that standpoint. So uh, that's that's kind of the, the deal on the W-2 fraud. Wow, that's very scary. I mean, talk about uh, a way to really horrifically ruin your employees' financial lives there. So something you definitely want to protect your company and its employees from. Um, another question that came in here, actually two different questions. One is, you know, you have, do you have any suggestions on how to get executive support for security awareness? And then Becky just asked, uh, kind of along the same lines, what do you do if your administrative team doesn't agree with doing fix phishing exercises? Yeah. So, you know, executive support, that's something that everybody kind of worries about. Now, fortunately, um, things like uh, WannaCry and, and those sorts of attacks have brought it to the forefront that this is a real problem, okay? This isn't just us being ultra paranoid. This is a real thing that's going on, and, and it's pretty catastrophic when it comes to what the attacks are doing, okay? Um, so that has helped bridge that. Now, when you speak to your executives, you want to speak to them in, in the languages they understand, which typically speaking for executives, especially in the, the C-suite folks, um, they understand numbers and they have to compare numbers across different things. You know, people want money for advertising. People want money for this, for that, for security stuff. Okay, got it. There are all of these kind of hands in the pot that people are, are needing money for. So you need to be speaking about that in terms of uh, ROI. 
in terms of the risk uh, in quantitative numbers. Again, I talked a little bit about quantitative numbers uh, before. Something that says, you know what, we want to reduce malware tickets by 25%. And each one of our malware tickets takes three man hours or something along those lines. So that means over the course of time, it will reduce our cost by this much. Or, you know, you start putting things into financial terms when it comes to that for the executives. Uh, and that's the, the type of communication you want to have with them. Most of the time, what I find is when people have pushback from the executives, uh, it has more to do with not speaking their language. The other thing that happens when it comes to the phishing pieces, your messaging is absolutely critical. When you talk about phishing uh, to your leadership, when you talk about what you're doing, the message always needs to uh, be that you're educating them, that you're teaching them, not that you're out to get them, not that you're trying to catch them doing something bad. It's always a matter of reinforcing the training that you've already provided them and giving them a chance to exercise it. Um, recommend doing things like maybe a quarterly um, lowest clickers uh, pizza party for the department or team with the lowest click rate or something like that that's positive though. Uh, you never want to shame them. You never want to put up a wall of shame and go, oh, Fred over there, or, you know, accounting did it again. Um, that's the kind of stuff that'll get you in trouble. But if you keep a positive message about it and you get it to where people understand that, you know, clicks are going to happen, but now what do we do about that? How can I not do that in the future? Um, that'll make a big difference on selling that to your leadership if you keep with that positive uh, imaging. Yeah, that's great advice. Keep it positive, keep it educational, and use numbers that the executive re executives really respond to, real financial numbers. Um, also something I noticed here on your resource list while you were talking is the free phishing security test. So it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, you know, once you educate the executives to get their permission to spend zero dollars to do a free phishing security test and, and just see, uh, see how the employees are, are currently um, educated or about phishing and and develop that sort of baseline. Is that yeah, true? I mean that's a fantastic tool for that because what you do is you end up getting that uh, that free test done and it'll give you a number. Um, and this is, what I found is a lot of people are shocked at how many people in their organization fall for these phishing attacks during these numbers. I've seen percentages, you know, in excess of 30% of the people are clicking on these links and people are like, oh man, you gotta be kidding me. Um, there was actually even one where they they stopped the test. They said, we got enough, it's so bad that it's easy <laughs> to go back to them and go, you know what, our people will click on anything, guys. And we all know that that's not a good thing. You're not, you know, you're not, uh, you're not being disingenuous when you're saying that this is a real threat that's here. And by the way, boss, you know, 30% of our people want free pizza and they're willing to click on the links for that. Um, that's a, that's a pretty eye opening way to do that. And again, totally free. Very nice. Very nice. And I think we just have a couple minutes left for one more question. And that is, you know, maybe you can kind of sum up. I know you talked about the human firewall concept. You, you offered so much great advice in your five takeaways and the five best practices. If someone were to get started trying to change their end users from being a liability to a human firewall, what should they do? What steps? What are a few steps they should take? Um, quite frankly, man, that ASAP tool. Um, which actually I don't see it on here, that uh, automated security awareness program tool is a fantastic way to get started with that. Um, it, it just lays things out so nice for you. But uh, initially what I would say is if you're gonna start something like this or you're interested in starting like this, start the messaging now. Start that positive messaging now. Start you know, getting people to understand how bad the problem is. Maybe start making a, like a short newsletter that you send out to everybody. Um, those can be very, very powerful when you're sending something out uh, to folks and, you know, they're able to go, oh, wow, um, I, I see what you're saying here. Um, these are going on. Then when you present it to somebody, um, you know, you can get the rest of that stuff bought off. But I would start with making people aware of all of the attacks that are going on out there and all of the things that are that are currently happening. Absolutely. Yeah, great advice. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, let me go ahead and announce our Amazon $300 gift card winner. While I do that, Eric, you want to put up your contact info there? Absolutely. There we have it. 
All right. Um, so the winner of our Amazon three hundred dollar gift card is Alicia Nguyen, N G U Y E N, and uh, Alicia is from Maryland. So congratulations, Alicia. We'll reach out to you with your gift card. Uh, best of luck to everyone else on our next event. And for more information, uh, Eric, uh, his contact info is there on the screen. And you can always reach out to KnowBefore at KnowBefore.com. And their email is sales at KnowBefore.com. And make sure you check out all those great free resources and free tools that they offer, especially the ASAP tool, the Automated Security Awareness Program tool that's available on uh, KnowBefore.com. Eric, thanks so much for being on another webinar with us. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. And thank you, everyone out there in the audience for taking time out of your day to join us. Have a great day. Bye-bye.